think he beat his wife, raped her, and strangled her to death. Then he quickly thought of a plan. He redressed her in the clothes she went out in, forgetting to put her jewelry back on and oblivious to the fact that people may notice she wasn't wearing any makeup. He put her in the car and drove it just a hundred yards from their home. He propped her up in the driver's seat, forgetting to buckle the seatbelt or even to put her feet near the pedals, and then slow rolled the car into the ditch. He also did not think to lean her body forwards as it obviously would have fallen had she actually gone downward into a ditch. Then he went back to the house and started cleaning up, probably thinking he had time. But then the news carrier found her car, called the police, and everything started moving really fast. He spoke with police, but only briefly. He knew then that he had to start making the calls, so first he called Charlotte in a lame attempt to plant in her mind that he was checking on Kathy before she was found. When Kathy's parents got there, he was still washing clothes, probably the towel Kathy was wearing, his own clothing since he answered the door in boxers, and anything used to clean up the scene. By the next day, he was already disparaging Kathy to her family, claiming that she was using cocaine. He was also swearing up and down to the family that he didn't know she had a boyfriend. Later, at the civil trial, he would insist he didn't know about this boyfriend until he went in for formal questioning the next day. But that is contrary to what her family testified to, and is also not the picture painted by Kathy's friends, who saw him as a jealous and controlling husband. Kathy's sister Sherry agreed, and also testified that he had been physically abusive to Kathy in the past. She also insists that her sister would not have had consensual sex with Steve. Before their separation, he had already been sleeping on the couch for a while, and she definitely would not have been intimate with Steve right before going to see her boyfriend. Sherry also believes that Steve found out where Kathy was that night. She was also interviewed for Unsolved Mysteries and said that Steve's sister told her that he found two telephone numbers on a notepad. He called one and Charlotte answered and then he hung up. He called the other and got the hotel room. And then he waited for his wife to get home. This is only Sherry's story. I cannot find anything about the two phone numbers or the calls substantiated anywhere else. But of course, like I said, the police didn't bother with phone records. And frankly, Sherry Valentine comes off as very credible in this interview. If all of this didn't already make Steve Page look guilty as hell, he would do something incredibly stupid that seals the deal on his guilt for just about anyone familiar with this case. And to me, it was probably the breaking point for Jimmy Fulton and the rest of her family. Steve was caught on camera desecrating Kathy's grave. Her family kept finding the flowers knocked over or destroyed, so they set up a camera, which caught Steve Page angrily kicking the flowers. He tried to claim later that this was out of frustration towards her family, but what kind of sick piece of shit desecrates his wife's grave if he didn't kill her, despite how he feels about her family? And if you really want to feel disgusted about Steve Page, check out his interview with Unsolved Mysteries. He's that kind of weirdo that speaks about himself in the third person. He also is still obviously bitter at his dead wife. He feels that her affair is what got her killed. He didn't elaborate who the affair was with on camera, but if you snoop around long enough online, the rumor he spread was that Kathy's boyfriend was a prominent married man in Beaumont. He said, quote, I am being blamed for her actions. She was out seeing another guy. So therefore, it could only have been me, because according to the police, I somehow found out and became enraged and committed murder. He says this with much sarcasm and coldness, and is infuriatingly playing the victim. And let's not forget that the Page marriage started as an affair. He never held any moral high ground over Kathy Page. Then, he proceeds to give his own ridiculous theory. Quote, there was a name of a certain person in Beaumont that was bandied about as the person who may have been involved. It's a very prominent family, an Italian family even. To let you know, they're considered part of the Beaumont Mafia. Just to let you know, the Beaumont Mafia isn't a thing. Google doesn't even bring up the silly interview to connect with that phrase. But Steve Page swears he's received all kinds of threatening calls over the years 
from the so-called Beaumont Mafia, telling him that he'll wind up like his wife. It's laughable. What is not laughable is what happened to his daughters. He moved Aaron and Monica to Tennessee almost three years after Kathy's murder. By then, the girls were disillusioned with their mother's family. Aaron wrote a blog up until a couple of years ago at texasbillboard.blogspot.com where she speaks of grief and blame. One sentence stuck out to me. After losing one parent, no child wants to hear anything negative about their other parent. Of course not. But I think it's understandable on the part of the Fultons to try and make the girls understand what their father had done. There probably isn't a child psychologist who would agree with this, but I imagine anyone in a similar situation may have done the same thing. The girls also found out that the Fultons wanted custody of them, and they were frightened. According to Aaron, the Fultons persisted in bad-mouthing their father and obsessing over her mother's death. I think it is unsurprising and reasonable that she could not process their rage. Erin credits her father's family for actually taking care of her and her sister. She said that once they left Texas, Steve left her and Monica with his sister and took up with a married woman. Erin, in the 10th grade by then, collected her sister and their belongings and showed up on his doorstep. She wanted to force him to take responsibility for her and her sister, but he didn't. Just a couple of months later, she and Monica were living with his parents and never moved back in with their father. Aaron claims that though there were many other reasons, this is essentially what ended the relationship with her father. She does not speak to him or the Fultons to this day. Sadly, Monica died March of 2011 from a drug overdose. I have seen it called suicide in a couple of reports, but Aaron simply says her sister died. She gives no detail. But after what these girls had been through, I'm not sure we need much of an explanation. Erin struggled with her anger at her father, and even more so at her grandparents and her mother's sisters. She hated the billboards and wrote new blog posts when a different one would pop up. She said, quote, To me, this billboard is not about my mother. It is about two stubborn, selfish men with too much guilt to carry. But she never says she believes her father is guilty, and even hints to some of the unsavory rumors that her father originally spread. It aligns with how she seemed to tell his side of the story at the civil trial while her sister did not. And this is probably really why Monica died. Whether it was an accident or suicide, she turned to drugs to deal with the pain and conflict her father and her mother's family put her through. I think Monica did believe her father killed her mother. Aaron doesn't explicitly say that either, but it is a feeling I get when reading her blog. Erin is unsure of herself and wavers in her writing. She is clearly angry when a new billboard goes up, posting pictures of the latest billboard along with her writing. Reading her blog is heart-wrenching. It is a raw and unflinching look at the pain she was in and the realities of grief. She hasn't written anything since July of 2014 when the last billboard went up. She is clearly trying to move on with her life and is now a mother of two sons. And what of the billboards? There is one standing to this day. Over the years, they have changed. They started with the three billboards I mentioned in the beginning, reading, Vider Police botched up the case, waiting for confession, this could happen to you. A later billboard read, I believe my daughter was being raped while she was strangled in 1991. The Vider Police would not accept outside help and the case has never been solved. I believe the police department did not want to solve this case. Will you be the next unsolved murder? After the Fultons won the civil trial, they were awarded $200,000, and Jimmy Fulton began naming Steve Page directly on the billboards and also outright accusing the police of a cover-up. The current sign reads, Steve Page brutally murdered his wife in 1991. Vider PD does not want to solve this case. I believe they took a bribe. The Attorney General should investigate. In 2012, Vider Police Chief Dave Shows, who was one of the patrol officers who responded to the crime scene in 1991, said he was sympathetic to Jimmy Fulton and wasn't offended by the billboards. 
He did have one bit of criticism, though. He said, You put up a billboard that 70,000 people a day see, and you don't have the intestinal fortitude to say who took the bribe? This is not a bad point. Whether or not the Fultons actually believe the police were bribed is up for debate. What isn't up for debate is the fact that these billboards still say a lot about the police and Viter, Texas in general. It's a small town that is still segregated and still suffering from racism and inadequate leadership. Almost 50 years after the original racist billboard welcomed visitors at the entrance, travelers on the I-10 get a daily reminder that the Viter police force is incompetent, if not outright corrupt. You may be asking yourself why the hell the Viter police would take a bribe from Steve Page, and even if Steve Page had the means to pay one. I wondered that as well. I thought these billboards were the rage and grief of a parent who was denied justice. I still believe that. But I feel like I have to point out the other rumor that does lend some credence to Jimmy Fulton's claims. The rumor is that the married man whom Kathy was seeing was a prominent citizen in Beaumont. And to protect his identity as Kathy's lover, not as her murderer, the Vider police did not vigorously pursue this case. Personally, I don't believe Steve Page has or had any real friends in the Vider Police Department. There are whispers that his family had friends, but other than the civil trial transcript, which characterized them as acquaintances, I can find no real proof outside of the Fulton's claims and, of course, the ever-reliable online comments. And unfortunately, a few different grand juries over the years have failed to indict Steve Page. If a grand jury won't indict, it's up to the DA to decide whether they are willing to risk double jeopardy. Most won't risk it because there is no statute of limitations on murder. They would rather wait and build a stronger case. I understand that. I also understand that when a case is left for years, public interest wanes, memories fade. In Steve Page's case, at this point, I'm not sure it's worth it to move forward. I go back and forth on this, especially if the physical evidence has been preserved. There has been no comment as to that evidence, but it seems to me if they were able to determine back in 1991 that the semen was from a man who had had a vasectomy, then they had evidence that could be tested for DNA. The first case where DNA successfully convicted someone was in 1987. I'm just guessing that Vider did not have the resources at the time for testing, and to be fair, the widespread use of DNA in trials would not be for several more years. And even then, early juries struggled to understand or even believe it as evidence. But times have changed, and DNA is now considered standard evidence in all courts. But the Vider police have never been able to charge Steve Page due to what they say is a lack of direct evidence and probable cause. So I think it's obvious that the physical evidence was lost. Why else would they not have tested it by now? Honestly, if they had it, wouldn't they have wanted to exonerate Steve Page once and for all and get the damned billboards taken down? Or wouldn't they have used it years ago to convict him, redeeming Vider's reputation and stopping the negative press? It's been almost 27 years without even a whiff of another suspect or any movement in this case. In my heart, I want them to put Steve Page on trial. The family won a wrongful death suit 17 years ago, but clearly that has not brought any closure. Yes, the evidence against him is circumstantial, but it's still strong. That doesn't mean I think they would convict him. Like I said, memories fade, and her own daughter wants this all to just go away. And I'm sure the district attorney is looking at the budget. If you've waited this long, what are your chances of a win? Pretty low. And murder trials cost a lot of money. The overall crime rate in Orange County, Texas is 19% higher than the rest of the country. I'm sure with that statistic comes a hard choice. You try the cases you can win. You plead out the cases that you can't. Unfortunately, those that fall in the middle often go cold. I do agree with Jimmy Fulton that the police botched this case. They let years pass before they even got a search warrant for the Page home, and they failed to search the area around the car or house. They also failed to subpoena phone records that could have supported some of the circumstantial evidence. 
and it would also appear they have lost crucial physical evidence. Hell, they even failed to put film in the damn camera at the crime scene. And bottom line, they should have treated Steve Page as a suspect the minute he opened the door at Kathy's house. They did not. This sort of thing seems unheard of in today's world where we are weaned on shows like Law & Order and CSI. But most cases are only as good as their original investigation. It's not like any new evidence is going to magically appear now. The new Vider police chief, Rod Carroll, said one of the first things he did when he took over was look at Kathy Page's file. He insists they still need evidence for probable cause. Quote, Sometimes someone will grow a conscience and come forward. Well, if he's waiting for someone in Vider, Texas to grow a conscience, there will never be justice. I think I would rather see Steve Page go to trial and risk him being found not guilty. He has gone free for this long, so it would not be much of a bitter pill to swallow at this point. It would be a waste of tax dollars, though, and I'm not sure the county cares enough to risk their budget. Kathy Page's murder has also been turned over to the Texas Rangers and is listed on their website as a cold case. Hopefully, they are actively investigating. But I am extremely doubtful that anyone wants to touch this case, because while the billboards may have kept Kathy's murder in the public eye, they are also a screaming advertisement for police failure and corruption, and no cop wants to be associated with that. Jimmy Fulton said that he has spent more than $200,000 on these billboards over the years. He is in his late 70s and fervently wishes for the case to be resolved before he dies. He hopes the movie Three Billboards will spark renewed interest in the case. I think it already has. But new interest is not new evidence, and I'm afraid there will never be a reckoning for Kathy Page. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. If you like the show, please tell a friend or rate and review it on iTunes. I know iTunes doesn't make this easy for you, but it is still the best way for others to find Southern Fried, so I really appreciate your help. I am also on Stitcher and many other apps like Auto Radio, Overcast, and Pocket Casts. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com forward slash Southern Fried True Crime. I have different rewards set for each level of donation. You can also support the show by visiting my shop at whatamaneuver.net. You can order t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, and even onesies for babies. They do great work with quality materials, and I'm really excited about this partnership. Again, that is whatamaneuver.net and search for Southern Fried True Crime. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime if you would like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing the Page case, along with the movie Three Billboards, come check out my discussion group on Facebook. It is linked to the main Southern Fried page. I would love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care. <laughs>